Perfect. It's my pleasure to turn uh, the program over to our uh, to Erica Jasper, who is our athletic director at CMS. Erica. Thank you, Evan, for the warm welcome. And thank you to all the Athena and Stag fans. And I think I see friends, parents, alums, coaches, and staff. Um, so thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we're super excited because we are able to share our incredible scholar leader athletes with all of you. I really think this is going to be an inspiring and also very fun night that we have planned. Um, before we introduce our moderator and panelists, though, I would like to give Evan as well as Jenna and the entire team from the Office of Parent and Alumni Relations for the opportunity to host this tonight and all the work they do behind the scenes to make this seamless for all of us. Um, also, Mike Sutton, as well as Chris Watts, really do also deserve a shout for helping us put this together, um, as well as all the work they do year round to support the SAGs and Athenas and CMS athletics. And I would be remiss if I didn't really give Mike um, a ton of credit and heartfelt thanks. Um, obviously, it's not too often as an athletic director, you come in and you get to work with someone who sat in your seat. Um, and in this case, someone who works tirelessly to make your job better and easier. And so I have really appreciated, Mike, our partnership over these last two years. And it's a true pleasure to work with you. Um, I'm going to admit, even though I, I love the Stags and Athenas, I think Mike still edges me out as the number one CMS fan. Um, so my goal one day is, is to maybe edge him out, but I don't know if that's possible. But um, Mike, just really appreciate it. Um, all your help that you've given us and all your support. And with that, I'm actually going to pass the mic to Mike to do our introduction of our moderator. Thank you, Mike. Yes, thank you, Erica. Uh, so true. Uh, and, and I will arrogantly take the number one fan moniker for now. Um, and I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to stay involved and partner with you in support of CMS Athletics. And I'm really pleased that our program is in such good hands right now. I mean, two years. Wow. And, and only a semester plus of live action. So it's uh, so much really good work has been done already by you in support of our Athenas, our Stags, our coaches, and our colleges. And uh, I'm really glad you said yes and that we have you on our side. <clears throat> so thank you, Erica. Um, and I'm really happy to be with you all today and especially to have the chance to introduce uh, a 2006 alumna CMC alumna Betsy Butterick. And it's wild to think that I've known Betsy for over 15 years now. Um, she transferred to CMC and joined our Athena basketball team for her junior and senior years, helping them to compete at the top of the conference with 20 win seasons. Um, Betsy earned all Skyac honors both years. She was recognized as our best defensive player in each season. And her, um, for her leadership, she was our captain in her senior year. Um, I also love that she played on our women's golf team as we were developing that group and preparing to start the varsity program. And varsity status came, of course, right after she graduated. Um, Betsy desired a life in athletics and has worked in the collegiate realm since graduation through her early service to the University of Washington, Stanford, and then at Occidental, although I kind of hated that. It's so neat to see the coaching Betsy does today. She's been a supportive alumna and helpful to several of our coaches and teams in recent years. And <clears throat> developing the human potential of individuals and groups translates across sports and industry boundaries and is so critical in achieving success and satisfaction in our endeavors. Her work ties in really well with our efforts to develop responsible leaders and helps us connect the dots between the academic and athletic experience. So we're very grateful to have Betsy join us today to guide the conversation with four of our terrific rising seniors. And I heartily endorse these scholar leader athletes as great representatives of CMS athletics. And I really look forward to hearing their thoughts and stories. So again, thank you, Betsy, for today and always. And welcome and take it away. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, Erica. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you for everyone that put this event together. And thank you for asking me to come back and to be part of it. It's always a joy. I, I tell the story that throughout my playing career and then my professional career, I have the opportunity to work with many institutions and teams. So 
I've worn a lot of shirts and been uh, a lot of mascots, but my favorite thing that I've ever been was an Athena. And I have a lot of pride in being an alum. And I'm so excited to get to re-engage with the student athlete leaders that we have today. So this is who you came to see. And so I'm gonna dive in and ask that each of you introduce yourself. Since our topic is leadership today, one thing that I found to be true about great leaders is that they do things differently. Or if they don't do things differently, they're at least willing to do things differently than maybe the norm or how things have been done in the past. So what I'm going to ask you to do, and we'll start with our individual for whom it is the latest where she is. So Flo, you're going to kick it off for us. And then we'll go Sammy and then Layla and then Sam. Flo, if you could start and simply tell us your name. Tell us what you're studying or what you're majoring in. And then also, can you tell our listeners what sport you play without saying the name of the sport? So what sport do you play without saying the name of the sport? Flo, we'll go to you first, and then we'll kick it over to Sammy. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Flora Degarian. I'm a senior, and I'm an environment, economics, and politics major. And I play a sport where you dribble without your mouth. Uh, you shoot without a weapon and you throw a ball into something that could otherwise be worn as an earring. Flo, well, that's one of the best descriptors of basketball, especially that, that beginning part, I dribble without my mouth. Thank you. Um, we appreciate that you have that skill set. Flo is also an advocate with the Claremont McKenna Advocates for survival, Survivors of Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence. So Flo, thank you for your leadership outside of basketball as well. Let's go to Sammy. Sammy, would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sam Rakeem, and I'm a rising senior majoring in government and economics. And I play a sport where everyone runs around and kicks the ball, and there never seems to be much scoring. Yeah, it, that's the beef that people are like, oh, I can't watch soccer. There's not enough goals. And they're like, they just used two balls. It would be so much more exciting. Sammy earned brownie points with me when I asked, you know, if you could be great at any sport that wasn't the sport you're playing now, what would it be? And he said basketball. So, Sammy, I appreciate you. Thank you. And welcome to tonight's panel. Let's go to Layla. Oh, and I will say outside of the men's soccer program. Sammy is also a research assistant at the Kravis Leadership Institute. So when we talk about today's panel of student athletes as leaders, their leadership shows up in a variety of realms and ways. So I'm excited to be able to talk a little bit more about that in depth as we go through tonight's panel. Let's go over to Layla. And Layla, would you please introduce yourself for the group? Hello, everyone. My name is Layla El Masri. I too am a rising senior and I'm studying a dual degree in chemistry and government. And my sport focuses on a clock, the lack of air and slamming into walls. It sounds like uh, wrestling with masks on or something like that. Layla, thank you. And I think we may refer to Layla as Madam President. Uh, Layla is actually the president of the Middle Eastern Culture Club, in addition to a variety of leadership positions within the community. So Layla, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And last but not least, Sam, would you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam Harrison. I'm a rising senior as well. I uh, major in the RDS BAMA Economics Finance Program, and I play a sport where uh, let's just say I ride horses underwater and hit a ball with a hammer. So, Again, a great description of water polo. And we can refer to Sam as Mr. President as he is the class of 2022 senior class president. So thank you, everybody. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here with you and to really talk about this topic of listen, learn, and lead. And we're going to start with listen tonight. And in my experience observing really great leaders, I found that leaders are often the first listeners. So we're gonna keep the same order for right now. Flo, I'm gonna pass it to you. Can you tell us a little bit about how do you make sure within your leadership role, people feel like you're listening to them? Yeah, I think um, Betsy already mentioned that I'm an advocate and part of our job at Advocates is um, being the first person that someone will talk to after they've experienced a traumatic incident or just providing general help. And that is all listening. You know, we're not, we don't have the qualifications to give advice. So it's really important to make someone feel heard, um, be an active listener, 
and follow up, come back to them, show that you actually understood what they were saying um, beforehand. And I think, you know, when we're listening, it's very easy to kind of zone out when you find something you want to respond to and um, kind of be waiting for the like moment where you can you can get in and say something. So really taking the time to carry on listening uh, throughout that, even if you have like a little a little aside that you want to add. <laughs> Yeah, so, and Flo, I want to tell you in case nobody has, so that whole, you know, we're listening, we're really just waiting to respond. What I found in some of the research is that most folks speak at a rate of about 150 words per minute, but most of us have the ability to listen up to a thousand words per minute. So that's a lot of extra time. And it's natural to fill that time thinking about what we want to say next. So it's not entirely your fault. And I appreciate your ability to listen. Sammy, can you tell us a little bit more about how are you intentional in the ways that you make sure people feel like you're truly listening to them? Yeah, um, I think Flora touched upon um, a lot of good parts. One thing I think is being extremely responsive and really showing that you're listening, not just listening with your ears, but with your facial expression um, is something I think that is extremely important. Um, and apart from that, I would say just acknowledging or carrying out what they are coming to you to talk about, um, because it, it's extremely important for people to be feel heard, but know that you are intentional with the actions that they want to um, kind of put into place. Um, so it's, it's really important to do that. And as well, um, to be able to be perspective taking and understanding where they are coming from um, and acknowledging that point of view is something that I think is really important in making people feel heard. Sammy, thank you. Layla, is there anything that you would add and I'll pivot a little bit to say, what's the difference between a good listener and a great listener? I know Flora and Sammy have mentioned a few tips or techniques that really anybody can do to make sure that people feel like we're listening. Is there anything in your experience you've come across that's like, you know what, I, I think this is really what differentiates a great listener from someone who's just okay at listening. Yeah, I think that what everyone else has said before me has been really great. And I think that I'd just like to say that actions often speak louder than words. And a good listener might acknowledge what someone else has said and like they might respond. But I think that a great listener, like Flora said, would really check up on someone or make a conscious effort to know, to let the listener know that they were listening and to let them know that like they're making a conscious effort to communicate with them. Thank you. Mr. President, is there anything after this long list of great tips about listening that you in your own experience would like to add to the discussion? Well, I'd have to really agree with Layla. You know, my, my biggest thing uh, when I'm trying to show someone that I'm listening to them is being very active, um, you know, hand gestures with your facial expressions and uh, repeating key phrases and thoughts, showing them that you're listening to them and that you're hearing and not only hearing, but, you know, delving deeper into thinking and asking, you know, why um, are they sharing this with me? How can I be there for them and listen with them on this and being very purposeful in your listening to, you know, have a great, better, better conversation and greater impact with the conversation. I love that. And Sam, I want to kind of double click on something that you said there and, and being intentional about making sure people feel like you truly not only have listened, but you have a deeper level of understanding with what they're going through. Let's flip that a little bit. And I want to know, has there been an experience where you've been talking with someone and you feel like they haven't truly heard you or you feel misunderstood? And did that situation teach you anything about leadership? Of course, yeah. So um, as a uh, class president, I was serving on the executive board uh, for the Associated Students of Claremont McKenna. And, you know, we're, we have these meetings and you have a lot of people with a lot of great ideas coming together and trying to discuss all these um, and find like a good course of action for whatever the agenda is that day and what's going on. And I realized, you know, participating in these uh, great discussions that um, if no one's listening to the other person, if they're just trying to push, you know, what they're trying to say, to try to get out, uh, nothing will get done. And no one's, it's, you're just going go to come to an impasse and your meeting that could have been, you know, 20, 30 minutes is going to end up being two hours long because everyone just keeps repeating themselves over and over. And so it takes a good leader to step back and recognize how the conversation is going um, and to step back and really see what each side is trying to say and boil it down so you can have a better team 
um, and their team can achieve more impact in that way. Flo, was there a time where you feel like you were misunderstood and, and that taught you something about leadership through that experience? Yeah, I think if I could like share a little anecdote. Um, so obviously this past year has been tough, like being part of a team and especially for me being like 5,000 miles away with an eight hour time difference has been really difficult. And um, as our seniors stepped away from the team um, at the end of the season, like as is natural every year, um, I obviously wanted to like fill that role and keep our, our freshmen and our incoming freshmen engaged throughout the summer. So um, I guess I like didn't really tell this to my coach that I was stressing about it. And when we had our end of year meeting, we had this really like candid discussion about how I just hadn't really communicated any of it or I was like so stressed by everything that I kind of made it into a me problem rather than talking about it. So um, I guess that's a time where I did feel listened to, but I probably <laughs> could have felt, <laughs> could have handled the situation better. But um, yeah, I think that those like, it's just communication is so important. Like if you don't say it and, and a problem shared is like a problem half really, nothing's that much of a big deal when you speak to someone about it. So um, that's definitely been, I think useful for me, like stepping into a leadership role on the team to like have that close connection with my coach. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate that you finally told her um, so that she could help alleviate some of that stress. It's hard sometimes being a leader and feeling, I'll say, responsible to know or to take on things. And oftentimes we fail to ask for what we need or what might be supportive. There's a phrase I say often, and that is we can't expect what we don't express. And yet people do it all the time. You know, it's like, well, they should know, or they know me so well, or I shouldn't have to ask. And it's like, okay, unless they have, you know, a magic eight ball, how are they really supposed to know? So if something's important to us, being able to express that. Sammy and Layla, I'm going to put this question out to both of you, going a little bit off of what Sam said, you know, being able as a leader to synthesize the conversation and then also be able to keep the conversation on track when people find themselves just repeating or filling the space so that we can be efficient with the time we have. How do both of you as leaders manage those types of conversations or facilitate conversations in that way? Um, I, I could start off. I would say um, in terms of facilitating and keeping on track, um, I think it's just really important to set objectives at the beginning of the meeting that you are having and saying, this is what we need to get out of this. And also at the same time, you don't really want to be someone who is just being the loudest person in the room. You need to hear from everyone, especially if it's a team effort or on a sports team or something like that. Um, everyone needs to contribute equally and needs to have their opinion heard. Um, so it's important to set these kind of ground, not ground rules, but destination points, I would say at the beginning, but allowing everyone to, to have their have their set. I love that phrase, destination points. You know, we have an agenda and being able to be flexible, but have a clear idea of where are we headed with this conversation? What's the purpose and how are we going to get there? Layla, would you like to add anything about how you facilitate as a leader? Sure. I completely agree with what Samay just said. I have a, a bit of a different approach. Um, I'd say that while goal setting is super important during a conversation that once we've set goals, um, if I notice that we're completely off track or you know, maybe not talking about something that we should be talking about, I think that I would just kind of say, hey, maybe we should move back to what we should be talking about. And I think that um, interrupting sometimes as a leader can be difficult, but sometimes it's necessary so that we can get everything done. But um, still keeping in mind like inclusivity and making sure everyone gets a say in things. So it's kind of a balance between the two. It is. I mean, it's absolutely a balance. And I'll say the best leaders are the ones that can navigate that fine line of you know, how do you cut someone off while being respectful? And how do you make them feel like their voice is valued while also moving the group towards kind of that destination point that Sammy had mentioned before? When we observe leaders, one of the things, the qualities that many great leaders have is this this idea that they cultivate curiosity intentionally. So great leaders are constantly curious and I wanna dive into how that shows up for each of you. Layla, let's start with you and then we'll go to Sam. Layla, can you talk a little bit about, well, let's actually go, what's the most recent thing that you've learned? Tell us something you've learned recently. 
Sure, I will tell you guys something I learned today. So um, this is kind of anecdotal as well, but um, aside from swimming and school, I work at Keck Science. I'm a research um, assistant there and I'm, I work in an environmental chemistry lab. And today I learned how to like use R Studio to code um, different emissions and over time and it was really cool and I made a really pretty graph and I was really excited about it and I I literally like took a screenshot and sent it to my professor I was like I did it guys I did it so it was just like kind of a breath of fresh air when you get something done but you learn something at the same time and it's something that you like to share I guess with others anytime you learn and then have the bonus of the pretty graph that's just like a whole different level of leadership sam have you made anything that's visually appealing or tell us something that you've learned recently well i didn't get to make a pretty graph in this but you know recently we've been looking forward to our fall water polo season coming back and stepping into a more senior role on the team um, you really have to be forward looking and seeing what challenges are down the road um, and what you can do now to begin to address those because as a first year sophomore, and even junior, um, you're typically just being something to do for the team. Um, and you're not as much looking forward to see those problems. You know, the seniors are doing that, but they don't really mention that they're doing that. Or I'm not sure, but I thought that was very interesting just to see how much time you have to spend um, thinking about the future and how to prepare your team for that. And I, I mean, I'm kind of in awe sitting here and being like, man, Sam, I wish all of the leaders thought like you do being intentional. Cause I think as coaches, we often take that on, right? How do I problem solve or prepare my team for the adversity that's coming or for what we're going to need to do when the time comes. So the fact that you as a student athlete are also of that same mindset is fantastic. Looking out for your teammates in that way, Sammy, and then Flo, can you tell us something that you've learned recently? Uh, yeah, my, my, I would say is a little bit more um, something I learned in the classroom, but uh, something that, especially with in light of like recent um, things with going on with government, um, is like the impact. There's a lot of positives to social media and the way we can um, have a large outreach to a lot of people, but also at the same time learning about um, kind of the impact social media can have um, on like political polarization and things like that. Um, uh, a big thing I would say with social media and, and political polarization is a lot of confirmation bias, um, getting things that are constantly being fed to you because these companies want to keep you on for as long as possible um, is something that I think is kind of interesting and something that I, I learned very recently. Thank you, Sammy. And that's very poignant and appropriate for many of the issues that are hot topics within our country right now. So thank you. Flo, what have you learned recently? Um, I made, <laughs> I made pasta from scratch the other day and it was like a real task and it took me like three hours, but I like put it through the pasta machine and I laminated it and it was a real labor of love. Um, but I was happy that I learned to do that because now I can do it again. So as with a lot of other things, it was a useful skill to learn. That's a life skill. I mean, leadership and life skills kind of go hand in hand. One thing, Flo, you're welcome to come over anytime. I think homemade pasta is one of the most delicious delicacies that we can hope to have. And when you said, you know, it took a lot of time, but it was made with love. For me, that comes back to the way great leaders show up for the people in their organization, in their team too. It takes a lot of time, like Sam was saying, to try to plan out, you know, what needs to be done and how are we going to get there? What are we going to do? And when it's done with love, that often tends to be some of the most effective leadership. I want to step away from sports now and take it into the classroom a little bit. I know when I was a student at Claremont McKenna, one thing I found surprising and also wonderful was in a highly academic environment, it was a ripe environment for competition, and yet there was so much collaboration. And I love that about CMC. I always felt like that was something special and unique. Sam, let's start with you, and then we'll go to Layla. Can you talk a little bit about how you navigate that collaboration versus competition in academics or in the classroom? Of course, yeah. So what I really think is special about CMC is the small school and the small classes. So it really feels like for me, um, you get to make friends just across the whole campus basically uh, with such a small footprint. 
so the people you're taking classes with, it almost feels like you're a team uh, with your class because it's about the same size as usual team. Um, and you're really out there looking out for your fellow peer. Um, you're not trying to be, you can be competitive and, you know, pushing each other to study harder. Um, but at the end of the day, you're always there to help the other person out because you are on a team together. Um, you are in the same, you know, class together. And I really think it's a, it's a really special community to be a part of. And uh, it's definitely a community that helps me push myself academically, being surrounded by so many smart people, but not in a way that's um, toxically competitive, uh, but in a way where we're all trying to make each other better. I love that analogy, Sam. I hadn't thought about how the small class sizes at CMC are very representative of the same number of people you would have on a team. My next thought was I was a junior when I first took calculus because I hadn't taken it before I transferred. So I was in a class with all freshmen and the analogy there would be, I was not in the starting lineup and I was like probably never gonna see a minute of playing time. <laughs> so that was my first C I ever got in my academic career. Layla, can you tell us a little bit about how you see collaboration or competition within the classroom? For sure. So for me, I just really think about like our time during Zoom and how like without friends and without people that I knew in my classes, it was like, it just wouldn't have been possible to get through it. And I just think that like working together, texting your friends, like, hey, remember this problem set is due tomorrow. Don't forget to do it. Texting your friends to like go to Zoom office hours together. So I think it's just sort of like working together and like helping each other out, reminding each other like when to do things. And if we have a question, like we can rely on each other in that sort of way that it's a collaborative environment. And if we didn't have that sort of backbone to rely on, we would just be getting these emails like, here's the curved average of your exam. And you'd think, oh, panic. This is so competitive. But knowing that you have these people that you can rely on and message if you I don't understand problem 1a or something on a problem set it's just really helpful to help you get through absolutely i don't understand like 1a b c and then all the way through 10 so i wish i had that ability to uh to text you when i was back doing problem sets Flo and sammy would you talk a little bit about i'm going to twist this a little would you talk about when competition is a good thing academically and how you as a leader embrace competition in the classroom? I can go first. Um, I would say competition is a good thing in the classroom. Like while what Sam said with small class sizes, um, that there is a lot of collaboration because you're friends with the people in your classes and you know gener uh, generally a lot of the people. At the same time, it is a smaller class, so um, you really push each other to to do as do the best you can. I think that's a good thing because it brings out some of the best in people. If you need, if you are, if you're in a comfortable environment, um, it won't always push you to be your best. Sometimes you need to get out of your comfort zone and be in an uncomfortable space. Um, so I would say in that way, um, competition does breed success. And leaders are typically very good are very comfortable being uncomfortable. So I think you make a great point there, Sammy. Flo, I know I put you two on the spot with that question. Is there anything that's true for you in the way that competition actually adds to kind of the success or, or the experience that you've had as a leader? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I was kind of reflecting on this, how like my academic journey has changed. I came in like really not knowing what to expect at CMC and wasn't really any in any or didn't really like have friends in some of my classes um whereas like now when I'm taking my classes within my major and I'm taking them with a lot of people I already know um it is a lot of collaboration but that kind of natural competitive sort of edge that comes out when you're like how did you do or like I did I did okay how did you yeah I did okay too like that kind of thing is like it makes it a lot more fun to be honest like having those relationships with your peers and like it's, it's friendly, but like there's those little moments of, of competition that are quite exciting, I think, so. Yeah, and it's hard to get like the competitiveness fully out of it. And it's always there a little bit. Thank you for those answers. I want to, and I'll say one of the best books I've read recently is by Adam Grant and it's called Think Again. And the whole premise of the book is 
it's not necessarily what we know or the knowledge that we've acquired that makes us successful. Oftentimes it's our ability to rethink what we know or in a way to unlearn what we've learned so that we can be more responsive to what's needed right now. So Flo, I wanna start with you and then let's go to Layla and then Sammy, then Sam. Flo, can you tell us something you've had to unlearn in order to become a more effective leader? Yeah, I think um, I'm very much that kind of person that's like, oh, I'll just do it myself. Like, I think I trust myself to do it well, so I'll just do it myself. Um, so really realizing that like, you don't have to do it all and like delegation is really important or just talking uh, to your, like as a, as a senior on a team with four other seniors, like working with them. Um, so kind of unlearning that I'm the best at everything and I need to be the one that does it, otherwise it won't get done properly to, really moving to be more collaborative and um, understanding that even though people have other things going on like they can still get it done and you can even tell them what to do and they'll probably get it done so that's definitely been a learning for me. Flo I appreciate that and I, I call that an admission of vulnerability when we admit something as a leader that maybe we're not necessarily the most proud of and yet it's a really connective moment Speaking of connected moments, that reminded me, and I'd like to see a show of hands. Uh, I've gone gallery view here in our audience. How many of you out there are of the competitive nature when it comes to groceries, where it's heavy, you've got a lot of them, but if someone says, oh, do you need a hand? You're like, oh no, I'm good, I got it. Anybody get competitive with the groceries? One trip, one trip only? Anyone offers a help? Okay, yeah, great. So we have a very competitive group here. Thank you for your vulnerability and your honesty as well. Let's go to Layla. Layla, tell us about something that you needed to unlearn or let go of in order to become a better leader. Yeah, so I'm a super like talkative person and I always love to get my points across, especially in class. I'm the first one. I just want to say what I want to say. But as a leader, like you cannot be talking over people all the time and you have to give others like the space to get their thoughts out first. So I've sort of had to like learn to give others that space and not be so loud all the time. Um, like just giving others like the like space to think and listening really well. Um, yeah, because I think that just being a really like energetic and talkative person, um, trying to get my points across first is not helpful all the time as a leader. And so just learning how to, um, just make room for others, I think is something that I've learned, um, helped learned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I appreciate that Layla. It's hard, especially when you are someone who's more naturally talkative or outgoing to press pause and intentionally take a step back and create that space for others to speak. There was a, a statistic I came across once that really shifted my perspective on making sure I don't speak first. And it was that the average American becomes uncomfortable after four seconds of silence. The average introvert takes seven seconds to respond. So now when I'm facilitating Zoom meetings, I start in my head counting when I get to four and I really start getting itchy because I want to speak and just save everyone from the awkward silence. I remember I need three more seconds for the introverts to have space in order to respond. And then I wait a little bit longer and just see how uncomfortable I can get before someone breaks the silence. So I appreciate you being intentional about it, creating that space. Sammy, can you tell us something that for you, you had to let go of or unlearn in order to be a better leader? Of course. Um, I think I think something that's really prevalent among a lot of people um, that come to Claremont McKenna and play um, sports for CMS is everyone that comes is pretty much a, a leader and um, in, in in their own in their own way. And something that I've had to maybe not unlearn but learn is in order to be a great leader, you need to know how to be a great follower. Um, so when you come in as a first year, you know you would like to be the biggest leader, but there's people who have been before you or older people on the team who probably know it a little bit better than you. So learning from those people, being a good follower, and then once you're in positions where you've learned a little bit more, then taking those things that you've learned and, and then you're a more efficient leader after that. Sammy, so, that's such an important lesson, this idea that leaders are the first followers. You know, instead of putting leadership up here and, oh, come with me, it's let's go together. I love that, thank you. Sam, what can you add for us? Of course. Well, I completely agree with Sammy that, you know, a lot of people at Claremont on these sports teams and at the whole school are leaders. And, you know, what I had to unlearn is 
not everyone has the same leadership style. And so you really have to become comfortable following other leadership styles, even when you think that you know, your way is the best way and this is how you've done it. And that's how it's been working for you really well. Yeah, um, there are, you know, there's always other ways to solve the problems. Um, and so I think being able to unlearn um, your leadership style or not unlearn your style, but being able to adapt to other styles and becoming comfortable with following others as well. Yeah, Sam, great point. And it's gonna lead to, to a question that's a little bit of an impromptu. What I'd like you all to think about for a moment is if you had to define your leadership style, whether it's in a word or two or, or one or two sentences, how would you describe your leadership style within the team, within the community as a whole, whatever is most relevant for you? And when you feel like you have a good handle on, yeah, this is how I'd, this is how I'd explain it. Go ahead and unmute yourself, no particular order. Sure, I'll go first. Um, I think the biggest part of my leadership style is listening. Uh, you know, you're a leader of a group of people. Um, you wanna make sure you're listening to those people and acting as a collective. Yeah, I agree with Sam, uh, but for me, I think it's more of like an action taker. Um, when I'm like listening to everyone, I think that like the, the thing that I do most is I like to take action and really like sh make a, showing of what I've learned. So like making sure that a goal is accomplished, maybe. Thanks, Layla. I would say, I guess two key things I think I would say I do is um, I lead through communication and positivity. And I think those are the two biggest things that I, I show on my team. Thanks, Sammy. Flo? Yeah, I think like uh, being my team's biggest supporter, I think I'm like my attitude is always really like I just care about them so much and like I want to instill the confidence I have in them, you know, to, for them to have it in themselves. Um, so just being like a big screamer on the bench and just really, really looking after them. That's awesome. And vocal leadership is absolutely one style of leadership. And yet in all of your answers, there is this continuity, this common thread of, of we, you know, it's not about me. It is about we, it's about us and the journey that we're taking together. There was a, I forget the guy or the handle of the individual who posted this yesterday on Twitter, but the prompt was the best leader I've ever worked for was great at blank. And I remember reading that and thinking well, the best leader I've ever worked for was great at making sure that I knew I wasn't working for them, I was working with them. So to hear that you all are very much leaders for whom this is us doing this together, even though I'm in a position of leadership perhaps within our team, as Sammy said, so many of the, the students at Claremont McKenna are leaders in various ways. I want to talk now about this, you know, we talked about listening, we talked about learning. I want to move now into the idea of leadership and what it looks like and what it means. And part of the, I'll say the, uh, the weight of responsibility that comes with leadership is that sometimes it's very difficult or challenging to lead. And what I'm hoping you can share with our audience today is a time when you felt like leadership was challenging for you. And how did you navigate that situation or context? Let's start with Sammy. And then we'll go Flo, then Layla, then Sam. Yeah, I would say a, a time where it was really tough to lead, but it was equally just as important to lead. Um, and I think it's the case for a lot of people is just during the online environment. Um, it's really tough when you have people, you know, I'm sure on Flo's team eight hours away and people on my team, sometimes I was abroad and I was uh, nine hours away. Um, but it's really important for people to stay together during that time. It's really tough when they're not just a hall away and you can go like knock on their door and say, hey, I need this or, or hey, let's do this. Um, so I would say that's a time where it was, it was really difficult, but it was really important. And to kind of get out of that, it was really important to have um, efficient communication and um, effective communication and uh, consistency. So if you were, if you had time set to meet, it was really important to meet to those times because everyone is doing a bunch of different things and different places around the world and different things they have to do. So keeping to the times that you said you were going to set, um, I think is something that really helped and just constantly reaching out to people, not in terms of your sport, but just how are you doing? Not so much like how are you doing with 
soccer, but how are you doing? How's your family doing? Stuff like that. Being extremely empathetic is a way to that I was able to navigate through that. Awesome. Empathy, communication, consistency. Absolutely. Thank you, Sammy. Flo. Yeah, I definitely agree that like this has been the hardest time to be on a on a sports team. Um so I think basically all of what Sammy said and also just kind of how my leadership, I guess, changed from the fall semester when I was really struggling with, I guess it's maybe just being in England and it's like raining all the time or just a bit of everything to be honest, to spring semester when I just, I was seeing my teammates on workouts and leadership felt a lot easier when I like really knew the the new freshmen and I could see everyone's faces. So I guess that like transition of making sure that you, leadership is hard when you're not like right yourself, but it's a lot easier when you're when you're feeling good about everything. So check yeah, it in is so, important. That's so important, Flo. And I think, again, as leaders, sometimes we feel the responsibility to give or to do or to know or to provide and, and to be okay when we're not okay. And equally as important or more so is our ability to recognize when we're not at our best and how do we intentionally kind of fill our cup so we can pour into others. Thank you again for your honesty. Layla and then Sam, please. Kind of just echoing the frustrations of the pandemic. Um, the the thing that comes to mind for me is I um, I met with my coach Charlie, and I just told him how frustrated I was that not all of the team members were t participating in our like team zooms, and you know it just seemed like morales were just sort of low because everyone was apart and we'd much rather be together. And so I guess um, we just kind of set out to be like, you know what, what are we going to do? Like, how are we going to try and convince everyone? And so like we had a rising seniors meeting and just recently we decided that we were going to call all of the like rising sophomores individually and just be like, you have to come, you're going to come meet with us. Just, you know, like boost morale and try to like get things like a semblance of normalcy as we return to campus. Thank you, Layla. I appreciate that. Sam. I completely agree and echo everything that's been said so far for this question. This, you know, this past year was really difficult to be in a leadership position, um, especially because all of your communications are all online. And as we've all felt, um, everyone wants to be as far away from the computer as possible by the end of the day. So how do you bring your team together when that happens? And whether, um, what I'm reminded of when I think of this question is serving as class president this last year. Uh, my main job is, you know, bringing a class together located around the globe that wants to not be on Zoom for any longer than they need to be. Um, specifically, uh, we sent out a mental health and workload survey um, in the fall semester because it was condensed. You know, a lot of students were struggling with a lot of um, just their workloads and not seeing friends in a full online semester. And, you know, as a student, uh, the class presidents and I were also all going through all the same things. And that felt really um, it was difficult to kind of lead through that and follow through with it. But, you know, we all thought back to uh, the job that we signed up for, which was, you know, bringing the class together and serving the class. And so that helped us power through and it was integral in securing a spring break for the spring semester. So it's all about um, focusing on your goals and completing the job that you signed up for. Yeah, Sam, I love that. And that message that you know, Flo touched on it's important as leaders that we're able to take care of ourselves and great leaders do a great job of taking care of their people. So balancing those two and then not only focusing on what work needs to be done, but how are we going to do that work? And how do we take care intentionally of the people that are tasked to do the things that we have on our to-do list in order to accomplish the goals that we've set? I want to be conscious of our time and leave some space for questions from the audience. So in closing, I have... Uh, I'll say that the quality, and we talked about a lot of them today, we talked about curiosity and, and, and many of the qualities of leadership, but the quality that I want to conclude with today, especially as we look forward to the 75th anniversary, is this idea of gratitude. And so if you would, as a, a way of signing off of sorts before we open it up for some questions, we'll go in reverse order. So Sam, Layla, Flo, and then Sammy, if you just finish by telling us what you're grateful for in the time that you've had as a CMC student athlete? I think I'm most grateful for the teammates I, I've been able to luckily, or I've been 
lucky and able to call my closest friends at the school really uh, you know I've made some really incredible bonds with uh, these teammates and call them my brothers and I know at the end of the day that uh, I have their backs and they have mine so thank you Sam Layla yeah same thing here just I'm so thankful for all of my friends that I made on the swim team and also my coaches and I think that I really don't know how college would be without the, that close bond that we share. And I think that all the friends that I made on the team really just reaffirmed my love for swimming. Absolutely. Claremont's a special place in part because of the quality of the people. Thanks, Layla. Flo. Yeah, I'm also <laughs> really grateful for my team um, and my coach. Uh, we changed coaches throughout my time at CMC. so my coach who helped us through that whole transition and and Erica to be honest who's just amazing and the people that come to our games sometimes when we get a few fans that's also really fun so just the whole system I'm really grateful for. Thank you Flo. Sammy. Yeah um, pretty similar I would say definitely the relationships that I've built um, coming into the soccer team I was always told you know this is a family that you're going to be coming into and you hear that a lot, but it's something that I've really felt yeah. and something that I've really wanted to pass on to the, the rest of the incoming SAGs. Um, I would say on top of that, just um, the experiences that we've had playing the game um, during the two years that I've had, we've had some uh, good successes, especially last year and looking to build on it. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely very grateful for my time as a CMS athlete. Thank you, Sammy. And I'll conclude before we open it up, I'll turn it over to Evan in just a second by saying that I'm grateful for the shared space that we have tonight and also for your resilience and the way that you as leaders have helped not only your teammates, but those in the larger CMC community navigate this time together, the way that you've shown up for each other and supported each other and, and been, I'll say, gracious with uh, all of your coaches who are also figuring out you know, how do they lead during a pandemic as well. So Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for the service that you provide in a leadership capacity to others. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Evan to address some questions that we have from the audience so we can continue to learn in the time we have left from the incredible individuals that have joined us tonight. Thanks, Betsy, and thanks to our four panelists. I'd mentioned in the chat, if you would like to raise your hand, which is in the participant section, we can bring you forward and call on you. You can also put something into the chat and we'll get to those momentarily. So Art Dodd is the first one to raise his hand. Art, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Thank you very much. So I, I know we have coaches with us this evening and I've heard coaches in their recruiting talk about the physical attributes at the athlete in front of them. But when they come on to campus and now they're part of the program, it's the issue of coachability that they highlight and want to communicate to their athlete. So I'd, I'd like to hear any comments from the coach-athlete interaction now that you're seniors and perhaps you've been pursuing these sports for more than 10 years. Um. I have like a note on this, I guess, that I've been thinking about as a division three athlete um, that, <laughs> um, sorry, I just saw the message from my coach in the chat. Um, as a division three athlete um, that you're, you have different priorities, I think. Um, we're obviously all like at the top of our game, um, but we have made a decision to, to come to this university for more than just the sports. So I think like, the interactions we have with our coaches, I don't know, maybe a bit more like grown up and we have a bit more of an understanding of like why we're here and what we're doing. Um, that's definitely in my experience, just maybe the conversations I've had with friends and, and past teammates who are in, in different spaces. That's like been a big thing in my experience in CMS. And Art, I'll add from a, a coaching perspective, oftentimes when we hear the word coachability, we put that responsibility on the student athlete. You need to be someone who's coachable. And if you, if you look at the language part, if you break it apart, we've got coach and able. And I think some of the coaches that provide the highest quality student athlete experiences are the coaches who are able to be flexible in their teaching. You know, how do I teach something that my student athletes need to learn in a way that is 
best for them, given who they are, the team I have this year, not just because that's the way I've always done it. So we talk about coachability in terms of something a student athlete needs to be or embody. And I think we also need to share that responsibility with the coaches on how able am I as a coach to be dynamic in my teaching and my education so as to best serve the student athletes in front of me right now. And speaking of coachability, we have Coach Ken Scumnini. Ken, you want to unmute? Yes. You guys have been fantastic, and I'd like to ask you a question. How do you bridge the gap with your team in the off season when you have like some that really want to work hard, like daily, and then the others, they don't want to work so hard. How do you, you know, bridge the gap between those two groups? Yeah, I think this is an instance where, you know, it's good to be competitive within your team. Uh, I know for, you know, herding water polo players in the off season is a bit like herding cats. So with that being said, um, some people do like to work really hard. And I think those people are the ones that really motivate those who are more distracted or not on top of their off season training. And that's what I've always found um, is the people that are very, you know, dedicated to their off season training are able to motivate people um, who are not as dedicated. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll just add, I, I always, um, I'll say invite, I don't wanna use the word twice, but for me, coaching is a continual process of invitation. And I think that happens on a, a peer level within student athletes too. You can't make anybody do what they don't want to do. Sure, you can threaten, you know, burpees or, or what have you, the equivalent in your sport. Having great leadership, having student athletes that are committed to doing the hard work and doing it in the off season, and then having that continual invitation of this is what we're going to do. This is what we need to do in order to give ourselves the greatest opportunity for success and inviting them to step into that space. And if they don't accept the invitation, giving them the next invitation and giving them the next invitation. When we continually invite and create that space for them to step into something we know is good for the team and ultimately good for them, it becomes a lot easier for them to say yes. And I see that door closed off and when, well, they didn't do the summer workout, so they're not committed. And now we've made this judgment that keeps us from inviting someone that we really do need to come with us in order to achieve team success. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very good point. I think Sam is definitely right. Um, I would also say like, it, it is really important um, if if there is this gap, um, the leaders being the ones to go to them and say like, hey, let's go do this run together instead of saying like, texting them saying, come out, you need to come do this run with us. You being the one to actually go do it with them. And even in a virtual setting, it's a little bit tougher to do that. Um, but I mean, there's FaceTime. There's a lot of ways you can get through this. Like they will FaceTime on a run together. So you being the person to actually facilitate that, that extra work um, is super important. Yeah, and just adding on to what Samay just said, I think that like since it is the off season, it is important to have a little bit of fun sort of mixed in. And so what we do on the swim team is we have fun Fridays. So like Monday through Thursday, we'll have like a regular lift and swim in the afternoon offered. And then on Fridays, it's sort of like a day to kind of like relax, kick back with friends at the pool, jump off the diving boards. So I think that like in the off season, it's important to encourage others to participate and work hard, but also maintain the balance of this is the off season and maybe you don't want to work hard all of the time. So we should also like remind ourselves that it's okay to have fun too. Great, thank you all. We have time for one more question and Jay Tremblay uh, in the chat is, who's a class of 1980 graduate, uh, is very curious about how you deal with feelings around sexual and gender identity and expression. Obviously uh, being at CMC from, and, and playing for CMS from 76 to 80, it was a very different environment. So uh, I think Jay's very curious about um, how, what you've learned and how you navigate um, and what, you, what you've, how you've maybe changed over the last four years with that regard. I, uh, I guess I have a note on this. Um, I think that within my team, like it's not really been a learning process for us 
well it has been but it's it's a much easier learning process for us because we're like growing up when this is a, like a much bigger conversation and it's more with like the leadership and the coaches and like those I just give the example of referring to a team like a women a team as women or like ladies and those kind of conversations is like it's it's hard to call people out and it's hard to stand up for yourself or other people in that situation because it's it's like a big change for a lot of the a lot of the like older people who we're working with every day so I think as as leaders and as teammates and as friends like it's it's it may be like a lot easier for us to stand up for our teammates or just make small corrections about things um so I think it's been a learning process but maybe it's an ongoing learning process for us and all the people around us I completely agree with Flora I do think that it's uh like a a learning process and it's continual and that I think that um, something that the swim team's done is like attend different talks and we've talked with Vince Greer who's part of a student engagement on campus and I think that just continually continually learning and um, making a conscious effort to promote inclusivity on campus is super important and I think that um, like sort of what Flora said little things standing up for teammates and maybe even just like at the beginning of the season, like making sure to kind of like set the tone, like this is what we accept and this is what's not tolerable on campus or within the team um, can really help promote that diversity and inclusivity that we want. And I think it could even come back to stuff we mentioned at the early, in the earlier part of the call where you're just being a great listener and being empathetic to every member on your team. Um, with any you know issues that they may have um, with the team and addressing that as a leader um, and being as inclusive and inviting as possible. I think those are great ways to um, work with this. I'll add also having patience and, and I'll say having courage. I remember doing my taxes this year, my wife and I filed jointly and uh, having a small business, I was talking with a, a, a TurboTax tax assistant. And he asked me, he said, well, is your husband in the business with you? And I said, uh, no, you know, it's just me. And, and there's always this moment of like, oh, do I take the time to explain that I'm married to a woman and not a man? And, and sometimes it's easier or more convenient not to, or, you know, you don't want to offend anybody. And recognizing that every time I pass on an opportunity to provide someone with an education, they're probably going to repeat that same unintended mistake with somebody else. So having the courage to say, you know, um, no, my husband's not part of the business. My spouse is a woman. And they usually say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You know, I didn't know. And they never, uh, in my experience, thankfully, they never mean it maliciously. It's simply that they're not aware that they've made an assumption given a certain context. And making them aware also gifts them the opportunity to make a different choice in the future. And so that's something that I've become more conscious about. I used to ask people all the time, oh, where'd you go to school? Until my younger sister never went to college. And so I don't ask that question or I ask it in a different way now because I'm trying to be more conscious about letting people tell me who they are instead of using language that makes assumptions about who they are. Great, well, thank you. Uh, Betsy for your time today. Thanks to our four student athletes for their time and their courage. Uh, thanks to Mike and Chris for helping us put this together. And of course, Erica, thank you for your leadership within CMS Athletics. Uh, we're very grateful to see uh, all of you here tonight. A reminder uh, that this is recorded and we will have it up online with our other um, virtual programs. Um, in, uh, in a couple of days. So hopefully you will be able to uh, uh, review and visit again. Uh, and of course, we hope to see you at future programs. Tomorrow we'll be with the Kravis Leadership Institute. Next week we'll be with Jack and Jill Stark talking about the Stark presidency. Uh, and we'll conclude next week and our spring programming with a conversation with the McGrubian Center for Human Rights, Professor Wendy Lauer. Uh, feel free to unmute, say your thanks uh, and say goodbye. Thanks everyone. Have a great night.